Hi, I'm Mason Vale from Boise State University. In this video, we're going to be talking about iterators for Java collections, and specifically iterators for lists. The collections interface implements the iterable interface, which means all collections in Java are expected to be iterable. They all implement the iterable interface. The one method in the iterable interface is iterator with a lowercase i, which returns a reference to an iterator, which is another interface. So the object that's returned, the iterator object being returned, is an implementation of iterator that knows how to iterate over the specific elements in a collection in a standardized way. One of the main benefits of this is that all collections then are able to be used in a for each loop. So the primary purpose of any iterator is to navigate through all of the elements of a collection in a standardized way. And we need this because collections could organize their elements in innumerable ways, and there could be multiple different implementations. So every collection needs to supply a custom iterator that knows how to navigate that specific organization. The promise of an iterator, any iterator, is that it will return the exact contents of its given collection one element at a time. Every element should be returned exactly once, no element will be left out or repeated. Now a secondary purpose of an iterator is that it can serve as a filtering mechanism. So in, a different, in addition to navigating, um, some iterators support another method that removes the last returned element in an iterator during its navigation. These are the three standard iterator methods. Regardless of what exact collection is being navigated, whether it's a set, a stack, a list, a queue, some kind of tree, these are the three methods that any iterator will provide so that you can navigate in a standardized way, regardless of organization. So the two navigation methods that all iterators have are a boolean has next method that returns true as long as there is still some element that the iterator hasn't returned yet. It returns false once it's finally returned the last element. So the has next method is usually used in loop control so you continue getting the next element as long as has next is true. The second method returns an element from the collection. So next returns the next element that hasn't been returned yet. And it moves the iterator through the collection so that that element won't be returned again. If you try to call next when there is no next, it is expected to throw a no such element exception. So in combination with has next, you can safely call next and not have to worry about throwing any no such element exceptions. Now, not all iterators support the remove method, but any collection that is mutable, changeable, is expected to probably re uh, implement the remove method. Immutable collections, ones that cannot be changed, generally do not support the remove method. So what this does, it removes the last returned element the last element that was returned by a call to next. Now you can only remove that element one time. So remove can't be called twice in succession. Every call to remove must have been preceded by a call to next. If you try to call the remove method and uh, next wasn't previously called, it will throw an illegal state exception. So you get exactly one remove that's allowed for each call to next. Iterators that don't support the remove method will always throw an unsupported operation exception if you try to call remove. To demonstrate the basic navigation functionality of an iterator, I have two examples of methods, both of which do the same thing. They both use an iterator to navigate through a list one element at a time and print out each of those elements on its own line, just to show something that we can do with an iterator. In the first example, we're explicitly calling the list's iterator method to return an iterator that navigates over the same kind of element that's stored in the list. So this is a list that holds integers, so we're getting an iterator that also iterates over integers. The while loop continues to iterate as long as the iterator has next is returning true. So as long as there are some elements that the iterator hasn't shown us yet, that while loop will repeat. The first line in the while loop gets the next element from the iterator and advances the iterator to the next position. So we're making progress through the list. So iter.next is returning our next element. 
which is an integer. We're then printing it out uh, at the end of that while loop just so that we have something that we're doing with this element. So this loop will repeat for each element in the list and print out each one. The second version of this method is functionally identical to the first. It's just we're using the for each loop and it's hiding a lot of the details behind the scenes. A for each loop requires that you pass in an iterable collection. So where you see list in the for each loop, that's a position that the for each loop requires that you supply something iterable. So the first thing a for each loop does is calls that iterable object's iterator method and gets back an iterator. It then sets up a loop identical to what you see in the first method, where it has a while loop, as long as that iterable, uh, sorry, so as long as that iterator has next is true, it's getting the next element from the iterator and assigning it to the variable that's at the beginning of the for each loop, integer element. So it's doing exactly what the above method does, but it's all hiding the details behind the scene. And once we've got that uh, next element, we're printing it out. So these two methods are both using the iterator to navigate through the list, and they're functionally identical. One of the great advantages of using an iterator for navigation through a collection rather than some other mechanism is that iterators are generally written in a way to, to provide efficient navigation regardless of the underlying implementation. Every element is visited exactly once and the iterator never loses its place between calls to next. So it never has to relocate its position again. Both of the methods on the previous slide allow us to navigate through all the elements in a list in big O n time. We visit each, n, each element exactly once, regardless of underlying implementation. By contrast, um, another kind of navigation loop that you might be tempted to write would walk through all of the indexes of a list and try to call the get method for that particular index to walk through all of the elements. And while this would work for some implementations of lists, array-based lists, this would be a disastrous list to write, or a disastrous loop to write, for other implementations such as linked list, where the get method is itself a big O n method call. So if I have, if I'm visiting each index in an order n loop, and internally I'm calling an order n method, those are multiplied. Order n times order n results in an order n squared runtime. So this is not the kind of loop that I could write that would be universally efficient. This method is providing us with a very simple example of a filtering operation using the remove method. We are taking in as an argument a list of integers. We're explicitly getting the iterator for that list that iterates over integers, and we're setting up a while loop similar to the one we saw in our first code example. So while the iterator has next is returning true, will continue inside the loop. And in the loop, we're checking to see if the value returned by iterator next is an even number using modulus division. So whenever next returns an even number, we're then calling iter.remove. And iter.remove is removing the last element that was returned by next. We're never even storing that value inside this method. We only use it for the purposes of the modulus division. But iter.remove knows to remove the last element that was returned by next. Now let's see how we can visualize the activity of an iterator in relation to its collection. So we're starting here with an abstract perspective of a list from the user's perspective. A list is simply a sequence of elements. And so here we have a four element list and we're labeling these elements A, B, C, and D. When we call the list's iterator method, it returns a new instance of its iterator that's conceptually queued up in front of the first element of the list. So the triangle shown in this picture is our visual representation of an iterator queued up in front of element A. At this point, that iterator has its has next, next, and remove methods that are available to be called. Based on where the iterator is currently located, has next would return true because there are elements that it hasn't returned yet. We can think of the iterator sitting in front of element A looking to the right and seeing if there is anything there. And since it sees the A, it knows that has next should be true. If I call next, I expect the iterator to return the next element and advance to the next position. But because no calls have been made to next at this point, 
It's a brand new iterator. If I call remove, I would expect an illegal state exception. When next is called, the iterator moves from being in front of A to being in between A and B, and afterward it returns the A that it just passed over. So next has not only returned the next element, but it's moved its position so that now it's in front of the B element. At this point, has next would still be expected to return true because the iterator can look to its right and see that there are still elements that it hasn't returned. If I call next again, I would expect the iterator to advance to the next in between position and return B in the process. Now that I've returned something with next, if I called remove, I would expect element A to be removed because it's the last element the iterator returned. So here we've called remove and element A has been removed from the list. It is no longer part of the list. The iterator is still in the exact same position that it was before. It's in front of the element B, the next element that it hasn't returned yet. So has next is still expected to return true. There are still elements to the right of the iterator. Next would still advance to be in between B and C and return B in the process. But if I try to call remove again from this location, I would get an illegal state exception because I can't remove A twice. If we call next three more times, the iterator has just returned element D and it's now positioned after the last element. So now at this point, calling has next would finally be expected to return false because the iterator looks to its right and there are no more elements that it hasn't returned yet. If I tried to call next again, I would get a no such element exception because there is no next element. And if I called remove, the iterator would remove the last returned element, which was D. And the iterator would still be sitting at the end of the list, but now it would be conceptually after the C because D is no longer there. The promise of using an iterator for navigation through a collection is that it will reliably return the exact current contents of that collection. When you finally get a false from has next, you should be assured that you have seen exactly the state of that collection. You've seen all of the elements in that collection exactly one time. So in order to provide that assurance, if the iterator detects a change to its collection from any unknown source, meaning not itself, if anything changes the collection while the iterator is active, it can't guarantee any longer that the contents that it has shown you are reliable. For example, something that it's reported as being part of the list may have been deleted or replaced. So as soon as an iterator detects that something has changed in the list, it immediately self-destructs rather than give you the false impression that it can be trusted to tell you the exact contents of this collection any longer. The way it self-destructs is that any method call to that iterator after the change is detected results in a concurrent modification exception, meaning something else has concurrently modified this collection at the same time the iterator was alive. So this idea that an iterator should self-destruct as soon as it detects a change is called fail fast. It fails as fast as it possibly can so that you aren't looking at inaccurate information. As an example of a fail fast scenario, here we see a list with an iterator that's positioned between B and C. So, so far this iterator has reported to its user that the list contains A and B. Those are the two values that have been returned for next. If some other code has called, say, the remove first method of this list and deleted the A from the list, the iterator should detect now, the next time a method is called, it should detect that something has changed in this list and the report that it's given so far may not be accurate. So if I call has next, next, or remove, what I expect to get from this iterator is a concurrent modification exception thrown. This iterator is never going to work again. So if I want to see the contents of the list now, I need to start over with a brand new iterator that will begin with the current list. A single iterator using its remove method does not have to self-destruct because the user of the iterator is using the iterator to remove elements. It's not an unknown change. The iterator's reported values can be trusted because the iterator itself is the only mechanism for removing elements. However, it's possible that you could have more than one iterator navigating through different parts of the list at different times. 
And if I have multiple iterators all active at the same time in the same list, and one of them uses its remove method, that iterator is allowed to continue because it knows about the change. But the other iterators were not part of that change. They don't know what happened and their results that they've been reporting may be invalidated. So in this particular example, I have iterator one has just returned element A and called remove. So iterator one is allowed to continue navigating through the list. But the next time someone tries to use iterators two or three, they will throw concurrent modification exceptions. They will fail fast because they weren't part of the change. Someone other than themselves has altered the list.